We hear about the students, the Buddha who heard one Dharma talk and gained awakening. And some of them seem to have some fair advantage. There's one woman who was going out on a picnic one day, and she took all her servants along and they played in the in the park. And on the way back, she stopped off and visited the Buddha. He gave her a teaching and she became a stream her right there, even as she was wearing all of her ornaments and all the fun clothes she put on for the picnic. And so we wonder, why doesn't that happen to us? Is there something wrong with the Dharma talks we're hearing? That may be a possibility. <laughs> The other possibility, of course, is that you're not ready. So the question is, what do you do to get yourself ready? As I've said many times before, the Buddha picked all the ripe flowers, ripe fruit. That leaves us. We're the ones who have to do the painful practice with slow results. All the quick ones and easy ones, they've, they've already gone. So that requires some faith. The sea is through the long haul. A lot of us cringe at the word faith, because we've grown up in a tradition where faith meant believing things that are illogical, unreasonable. And it's even sometimes said to be a virtue. The more unreasonable the object of faith, the greater the virtue. Now faith in the Buddhist teachings doesn't mean that. It means very basically faith in the fact that the Buddha really was awakened. He did it through his own efforts, and then he taught the Dharma well. And then immediately transfers to us. Because as he said, the qualities that he developed in order to reach that awakening were things that we all have. To some extent, not to his extent yet, but they're things that we can develop. I mean, he developed them the same way we develop ours, through heedfulness, resolution, and ardency. And so faith is what allows us to be heedful and resolute and ardent. The reason it's faith and not knowledge is because we can't look inside the Buddha's mind to see how awakened he was. And even though we can read the teachings of the Ajahns and be inspired by them and say, well, these people sound awakened. We don't really know. Faith here means belief in something that is reasonable, but you don't really know it yet. And it's good to admit to yourself that you don't know. That spurs you on to say, what can I do to actually know these things for sure? Like the principle of karma. Do you really have freedom of choice, or is there some evil genius, evil god behind you making you do things? Or is it just the stars, all very impersonal? You don't really know for sure. But if you assume that you do have freedom of choice, you're more likely to make the right choices or try to use that freedom well. In fact, the Buddha made that one of the prerequisites for having any kind of practice at all. If you don't believe that what you're doing now is shaping things now and into the future, what motivation do you have to practice, especially when the practice is going to take time and it's going to involve some difficulties? So you need to have faith that, yes, your actions do matter and that you do have freedom of choice. And that motivates you to look very carefully at your thoughts and your words and your deeds, and especially as your thoughts, because your actions come out of your thoughts. This is why we meditate. We like to think that we're meditating to bliss out for a while, and the meditation does have that possibility. But the bliss here is meant to be used. This is what's special about the Buddhist teachings in the middle way. It's not a middle way between pain and pleasure, in other words, a kind of neutral feeling tone. 
It's the realization that you can use pain and pleasure as means rather than as ends. And so there's the pain of knowing that there's work to be done. But then there's the confidence that comes in, well, I can do it. And as the mind begins to settle down, you really do find that there is a sense of pleasure that comes simply sitting here, still, focused on a very comfortable sensation in the body, learning how to maintain that without squeezing it and cutting it off, or just blissing out, as John Fung used to say, just letting your hands and feet go limp and just kind of wallowing in it. You want to be alert at the same time that you're feeling the sense of pleasure, because you want to use it to strengthen the mind. When you have some sort of evidence like this, it's not proof that the Buddha was awakened, but it is a sign that this is a way that makes sense. This is a way that can give you the strength to carry through with some of the more difficult parts of the practice. We hear that the practice starts out with virtue, and then it goes to concentration, and then goes to discernment. But, but actually, you have to develop all three at once. Virtue in your day-to-day -day actions, and you try to develop your concentration, and you try to develop your discernment at the same time. This way they strengthen one another. Now, for most lay people, the five precepts are plenty. But you may realize, okay, you need more than just the five precepts. This is why we have the eight precepts. They add the principle of sense restraint on top. And it's no use to ask yourself, well, why this has to be? In other words, why you need to be stricter with yourself. It's like going to a hospital and saying, well, why does that person have nice medicine and why do I have medicine that tastes bad? Well, your disease is your disease. And you face up to that, and you accept it, and do what you can to give yourself more motivation to stick with the path. Because the more difficult is you face, the more you're going to need faith to carry you through. I was once addressing a group of people who I knew from previous experience didn't like the, the topic of faith. And so I started the Dharma talk by saying, I'd like a show of hands, how many people here find that every day and every way the practice is getting better and better? There were no hands. Okay, there's going to be ups and there's going to be downs, and you need something to carry you through the downs. And that's what faith is for. So you figure out ways to motivate yourself. The Buddha recommends that you strengthen faith through heedfulness. In other words, looking around and seeing all the dangers that can come from careless actions. And sometimes you don't have to look very far. You can look at your own past and see that you've done a fair amount of harm through being careless. And you remind yourself, I don't want to do that again. The Buddha does not encourage you to get wound up in thoughts of guilt. He does encourage you to recognize mistakes and to resolve not to repeat them. Then he adds an interesting condition. He says, then develop the four Brahma-viharas. In other words, goodwill for yourself and for all other beings. The goodwill for other beings helps you to realize that you don't want to harm them. Goodwill for yourself helps you keep from getting down in yourself, and at the same time it helps prevent the idea that here I am just helping this person, helping that person, what about me? You remind yourself that while you do the practice here, while you're practicing generosity, practicing virtue, practicing meditation, you're benefiting. And it gives you the encouragement, it gives you the confidence to go on. As for concentration, it's the same sort of thing. Some people don't have to develop very strong concentration. We hear of cases of people who get just the first jhana and bang, they have their first taste of awakening. Other people have to go through long hours and get the mind really, really strongly settled before they gain the kind of insight that lets them see, oh, I'm doing this stupid thing here, and I don't have to do it, and I can drop it. So again, it's not a matter of fairness, or why does that person get away with less concentration than me? The question is, 
how much concentration can I develop? Whatever amount I need, I'm going to work at it. As for discernment, some people find that they can very quickly gain insights into the mind. Other people, they have to ask questions again and again and again. And I can hear asking questions means not only asking questions of the teacher, but asking questions of themselves. And they have to contemplate things again and again. And John Mahabhava makes this point that when you're doing body contemplation, you don't count the number of times that you've contemplated the body. You just keep doing it again and again and again. And at some point, something will hit you. That the issue is not the body, but it's the mind. Now you can say that ahead of time. But it's when you actually see it, the movement of the mind. What is the movement of the mind that wants to go to lust, say, or wants to go to pride around the body? The first little thought that sets you off, say, on a fantasy. What is that thought? What's its purpose? In other words, you have to look all around and ask questions in lots of different ways before you find the point that will make the difference for you. There's a sutta where there's a monk who goes and visits different monks, and he asks them, what is the point that you have to contemplate in order to gain awakening? And one monk says you have to contemplate the five aggregates, another monk says you have to contemplate the six sense spheres, another says dependent core arising, another says the elements, and he gets very confused. Why don't they all answer the same? So he goes to see the Buddha, and he said, well, it's because for each of them that was the topic that, he didn't use the word unlocked things, but that's basically what he meant, opened things up. And he gives a comparison with a coral tree. In India they have these, these trees, very much like the ones we have in front of the, the bathhouse here. The part of the year they're totally bare, part of the year they have leaves, and part of the year they have flowers without leaves. And if someone saw it at one season, they'd see this tree was just basically sticks. Another time they'd see it green, and other times they'd see it red. Depends on when they saw it. It's the same tree. So nobody can tell you ahead of time that by contemplating this particular topic, you're going to gain the, the insight that cuts things through and breaks through to the, to the deathless, which is why you have to look around and ask questions about this, ask questions about that. One of those places that teach you a Vipassana method, they're basically teaching a, a very subtle form of samatha or tranquility. Anything the mind does where it's told to do something and you do it repeatedly, that's tranquility. It's not insight. Insight isn't something you do. Some, it's something you discover while you're doing concentration. So there's no one guaranteed scientific or whatever Vipassana method that's going to work for everybody. Your particular defilements have their own particular configuration. And so you have to test and test again. Probe around, ask questions. Then you find you're asking too many questions, the mind's not still again, so you go back and you get the mind into stillness again. You've got these three things you've got to keep balanced, your virtue, your concentration, and your discernment. And with time, you find that you can bring them into balance. And this is when you start seeing the results that take you beyond just the ordinary. There's a passage in the suttas where the Buddha says, it's like the elephant hunter. He's looking for a bull elephant. He sees footprints, and he says, well, this looks likely, but we don't know yet. This is the bull elephant I want. Maybe it's a dwarf female with big feet. He goes along and he sees scratch marks up in the trees. He, well, they're tall females. Some of them have tusks, so this is not necessarily a bull elephant. He wants a big bull elephant because he's got work that needs to be done that only a big bull elephant can do. But the markings look likely, so he follows them. That's when he finally sees the bull elephant in the clearing. That's when his search is at an end. In the same way the Buddha said, when you're 
practicing meditation, the levels of concentration are like the footprints. The scratch marks up in the trees are like the insights you're being in to get. But it's when it's the breakthrough to the deathless, that's when you really see the bull elephant. And that's when your faith becomes, as he says, verified, it becomes unshakable. Because it's gone beyond just faith, you've actually seen, yeah, this really does work. The Buddha knew what he was talking about. Until you reach that point, there are bound to be times when you wonder if this all works. But again, that's just one of those fallow periods that are very natural in a complex mind. If you know how to generate faith, in other words, remind yourself that if you don't have faith in your own actions, what is there for you in this world? And it's good to have faith in the potential of your actions rather than trying to place faith in some outside being who may or may not exist, who may or may not feel well disposed to you. Or in some religions, has already planned to send you to hell, but for no reason of yours. Can't imagine how you have faith in that. The Buddha is asking you to have faith in something that really is worthy of faith. The power of your actions to find a true happiness. So try to keep being heedful and have faith in what you're doing. Have faith in yourself that you have this potential. And whether it's a long path or a short path, whether it's easy or hard, that's not the issue. The Buddha once said if you could make a deal that you'd be stabbed with a hundred spears in the morning and a hundred spears at noon and a hundred spears in the evening every day for a hundred years. But you were guaranteed at the end of that time that you'd re achieve awakening. He said it'd be a good deal. Awakening is that special. At least that's what he says. So it's up to you to decide whether you want to find out whether what he says is true or not. 